Okay. Welcome, everybody, to the second webinar of the FERA Flash Talks. I'm Lisa Rani, Director of Research at FERA, and we are continuing our celebration of FA Awareness Month with um, more exciting FA research funded by FERA and uh, presented by um, our junior investigators from all over the world. Um, we had a wonderful session last Thursday, and um, I hope you're all looking forward um, with me to today's talks. Um, as a reminder, uh, the presenters uh, only have five minutes uh, to share their research, and uh, we have asked them to explain it in lay terms so we can all understand not only what it means, but also the impact that it has on our, um, on our goal, our ultimate goal to, to find a treatment for FA. Um, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions after each talk, and you can type them uh, in the Q&A box. Um, remember to keep your browser open at the end of, um, of the webinar to vote for your favorite presentation. Um, last week, uh, flash talks were um, are already on YouTube. They were recorded, um, so uh, you can um, watch them if you've missed them. Um, and maybe we can drop the link um, on the chat in the chat. Today also will be recorded uh, and you can watch them later and share them with anybody who wants to learn more about FA research. Um, we can get started. Our moderator today is Cecilia Estrella. Uh, we'll take it from here. Uh, Cecilia, please introduce yourself and take it away. Thank you, Liz. Uh, hello, my name is Cecilia Estrella. Uh, I live in France. I joined the French Association for Friedrich Ataxia uh, like four years ago after the daughter of my partner was diagnosed. But um, I'm very happy to be part of this great community. And thanks to Fat for inviting me to moderate this session and all the, the research uh, researchers that uh, have so many passion to move forward the research in FA. So let's start. And the first presenter is uh, Sotirula Elina. Uh, she will talk about using lab-grown heart cells as a model to study Friedrich's attacks. Okay. Uh, you can see my screen, right? Yep. Okay, so thanks for the introduction. My name is Sutirulla. I am from Cyprus, currently studying at Imperial College. Um, how I firstly became interested in free dress ataxia. Uh, during my undergrad, I had a placement at the Cyprus Institute of Neurology and Genetics um, at the Neurogenetics Department, where I first heard about uh, uh, FRDA. Actually, this is a quite well-known disease in Cyprus because of the high frequency of the RDA carriers in a specific district of uh, uh, Cyprus, uh, Papos. And after that, I, I came for my master's, uh, again on Friedreich's ataxia, and then my PhD, which I'm currently on under the supervision of uh, Professor Festenstein um, on Friedreich's ataxia. So a few words about the, the DNA. The DNA is wrapped around proteins called histones, and depending the form, it can have an open structure form or a more compacted form. The open structure allows uh, the DNA to be accessible to factors, uh, so the DNA can be, so the, the gene can be expressed. When it has a more compacted form, uh, the gene is being switched off, and there is also an increase in repressive uh, histone modifications, these plaques that you see here, uh, which again suggests that, that the gene is off. Um, the ultimate aim is to um, understand how we can switch the gene back on, since in Friedreich's ataxia, the GAA triplet repeat expansion, which is the known mutation, uh, triggers the DNA to become um, tightly packed. And that's why we have the gene being switched off. So our aim is to understand the mechanism that the GAA triggers uh, the DNA to be tightly packed so we can switch uh, the gene back on. Uh, we believe that the, 
a good model to study the disease um, would be to actually uh, check it on the perform experiments on the actually affected cells, which are the neurons and the heart cells. So in our lab, we are using in this prepotent stem cells, which are cells that have the capacity to become any cell type we want them to. So in our case, we make them to become cardiomyocytes, and it's actually heart cells. It's actually quite interesting because under the microscope, we can see them beating just like a heart, and we get uh, uh, these colorful pictures as well. So uh, what we have found up to this point is that the prataxin gene maintains its lower levels. As you can see in the light gray here, uh, these are the FRDA lab-grown heart cells. At different time points, we culture them for 22 days, 30 days, and 105 days. And you can see that they maintain uh, the lower um, prataxin levels. Also, another thing we have observed is the increase in uh, heart disease markers, which is uh, uh, this group of genes that you see here. Um, again, in the light gray, you can see the FRDA uh, cells. Um, they have increase in these uh, heart disease markers. So um, it, it looks that something is uh, not good with these cells. Uh, also, uh, as we talked about this flux that you see here when the gene is being off, um, again, we have observed that in cardiomyocytes, in our lab-grown heart cells, there is an increase in this specific um, flux, these specific repressive histone modifications. Again, you can see them in um, gray color. These are the FRDA. So, um, what we suggest is that we can study free trace ataxia on these um, cell models, on these lab-grown heart cells, and uh, hopefully we will be able to understand the mechanism of the disease. And then um, these cells can serve as a platform to um, find, to test uh, how good a drug is, for example, first of all, by increasing the frataxin levels in the FRDA um, heart cells and also decreasing these bad genes, these heart disease uh, markers. So that's all. So. Thank you very much. Um, I'm seeing if there, if there are any questions, not yet, at least to me. Um, so there is one question. How frequently are you able to obtain patients' skin cells to do your experiments from? Um, so we have um, a collaboration and we got the cells from another lab. Uh, that is, this is one cell line. We uh, also have another collaboration at another lab uh, in Belgium. So the one is at the University of Alabama, the other one in Belgium. So we have these two cell lines and also we have control cell lines, which we are getting from, um, uh, we can buy from companies which are the healthy ones. But yes, of course, so all these experiments are done with these two and two cell lines, but that would be ideal to have a, a whole library of cells that have from patients to perform more experiments. Okay, thanks. Another question says, do you expect to see changes in acetylations or only in methylations? Um, we are checking the uh, methylation, uh, the H3K9 and H3K27 trimethylation, which is this one here. Um, but uh, normally, if there is uh, methylation, if there is this specific flux, the H3K9 and the H3K27 trimethylation, then there wouldn't be acetylation. So uh, we are testing methylation and we are, we are understanding acetylation. Okay. There is one other question. How long will these cells live? Uh, you said 105 days? Yes, actually, we, we checked. They can go up for months. We've been having them for uh, even six months. They, they, can, they can live, uh, but it's a matter of uh, time. Uh, and of course, ideally, we want to do our experiments, for example, on day 30, which is the earliest uh, possible because we want more data. Um, 
yeah, but but they live, they can live for a long time and they are big. Okay. Another question says, thank you for sharing your research. What is the carrier frequency in Cyprus and how does that compare to other regions? So in general, the carrier frequency in other regions is one in 90 around the world, the carrier frequency. In Cyprus, they have found that there is one in six to one in seven. So it's a very high carrier frequency. And that's from people or for people originating from this, uh, from Paphos, from this area here. Okay. So another question says, have you been able to communicate with any other uh, lab around the world working with patients as to develop FRDA heart cells? Um, uh, we know that there are publications. Uh, we've been in communication with a collaborator uh, doing neurons, um, which are the other uh, affected cell type. But we can communicate and compare our data. Okay. And uh, the question says, what approaches will you take to modify the gene expression changes of genes associated with heart disease besides increasing frataxin? Uh, in our case, we are going to use these uh, heart disease markers to uh, assess, for example, how good a drug is, the drug efficacy, rather than um, target the, the cardiac disease. So we are more of using it as um, an indicator and as a marker. Okay. That, that's our main aim. And ideally, if we manage to find a drug, we can see that they are going to be increased. Increase protection, for example. Okay, thank you very much. We are going to uh, pass to the next speaker, who is Maria Florencia Piñataro from the University of Buenos Aires. And she will talk about improving protection function with small antibodies from LAMAS. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Cecilia, for your presentation. I'm trying to share my screen. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Maria Florencia Pignataro. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Javier Santos Lab, uh, which is in Argentina at the University of Buenos Aires. Um, I work in FA since uh, 2017, and uh, the lab has been dedicated to understanding the molecular mechanism of frataxia and developing different ways of modulating frataxin activity uh, from 15 years ago, more or less. Uh, to begin with, frataxin, as you know, plays a key role in our mitochondrial metabolism. And these structures are really important because uh, they produce most of the fuel of the cells. So in that context, frataxin interacts and activates a molecular machine called, called iron sulfur supercomplex, formed by some units of different proteins. This complex provides the mitochondria with uh, iron sulfur clusters, which are special iron arrangements that are needed for the optimal function of uh, many other molecular machines. So when frataxin levels are low or unstable forms are present in the cell, the supercomplex activation is inefficient and the level of iron sulfur so, uh, clusters in the cell decreases. So uh, that leads to uh, cell misfunction. So in this context, the idea of the project was to intervene the production of iron sulfur cluster by enhancing frataxin activity with a specific small lama antibodies called nanobodies. So uh, as you may know, nanobodies, um, uh, sorry, uh, antibodies from human are a bulky formation of two protein chains. Um, however, um, uh, as you can see, the nanobodies are, um, the nanobody molecules formed form in, the, in the lamas are uh, consisted in only one protein. They are smaller, they are, they are easy to produce in bacteria or yeast and have the possibility to be humanized, reducing its immunogenicity. Okay, so what did we do to obtain the, the LAMA nanobodies? Well, a LAMA was injected with a small doses of human frataxin and also other proteins from the super complex. So this generates a vaccine effect in the LAMA. So after a few months, 
uh, we collected a small uh, quantity of blood from the llama, obtaining the DNA corresponding to different nanobodies produced by the immune system. After that, a selection process takes place at the lab. To the same, we uh, presented frataxin uh, to uh, the whole population of llama nanobodies in the context of a bacterial virus. After some rounds, uh, um, after some rounds of selection of presentation and selection, we obtain about hundreds of nanobodies against frataxin. Here we develop an extra step of selection uh, that is that we call a functional screening, trying to exclude the nanobodies that bind frataxin, but they are inhibitors of its function. So. Um, after the selection process, only the most suitable candidate pass on the next stage. At this point, the DNA sequences, uh, that is like the identity of the nanobodies, were obtained. We found 16 different nanobodies anti -frataxin. So uh, at next, we started the characterization. So we used bacteria to express large amounts of nine different nanobodies and found that eight of them form complexes with frataxin that remain together after going through a separation process, suggesting a strong and stable interaction. At the same time, in order to investigate if some nanobodies uh, presented uh, interaction that may uh, prevent frataxin to, to exert this biological function, we use an AI tool trying to predict protein structure that is called alpha four. To test the computer predictions in the lab, we submitted an antibody uh, frataxin complex to a powerful magnetic field that, to obtain valuable information about the interaction that is called a nuclear magnetic resonance scan. With that scan, we were able to see that AI predictions were accurate for this complex, and we will perform the same for other complexes just to see uh, the validation of the tool for the project. At the moment, uh, we were able to test the effects of frataxin nanobody complexes on the iron sulfur cluster activity and found that two of the candidates seem to be inhibitors, whereas se uh, five of them did not alter the activity, con uh, constituting potential candidates as stabilizers. But so more experiments now are being held these days with unstable frataxin variants. So in the next month, we will be testing the performance of most promising nanobodies in fridge ataxia cellular models. We will evaluate mitochondria oxygen consumption and also evaluate oxidative stress susceptibility in fibroblasts expressing nanobodies. So at this point, we also test to, uh, hope to test other nanobodies, again, other proteins from the super complex to perform a synergic strategy of activity modulation. Well, I would like to thank Farah for this opportunity to share our work and thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, I'm seeing if there is any question. Um, not yet. Mm. Maria Florencia, can I, can I ask you maybe just um, how do you, you said you humanize the nanobodies. Um, so how 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 does that work? Uh, yeah, to humanize it means that you could change the sequence of the selected nanobody in a way that our the sequence is when when we say the sequence is the DNA sequence that is as as I said that the identity of this protein candidate. We can change them just to. Uh, presented them to the to our immune system to prevent rejection of that protein. So to make it more like a uh, human. Okay, uh, I have another question. This curious to know why Elama was chosen for this study. Is in the basic explanation of what is an uh, Okay, <laughs> okay, that that is really nice. Thank, thank also for the question. Yeah, llamas have been used for this uh, for this kind of um, strategy to, to, to look for binders or, or maybe these proteins that antibody like because uh, they produce uh, like a small how do you say how would you say small uh, proteins that are alike our antibodies that, that are big ones and uh, they are also we can. Um, sorry, we can express that nanobodies, that proteins in bacteria in a, also in a cheap way and an easier way. 
So they, all, they have been used uh, also to, to produce antiviral proteins for, from, to protect uh, a person from COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Also, there are very, a lot of strategy. And there are also some uh, strat therapeutic strategy using nanobodies against some defects on platelets. Uh, one of them is, is in, in a clinical study nowadays. Um, so, so they are interesting approach to, to try for. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, one question says, what is the intracellular stability of nanobodies? And could these two inhibitor lama bodies be drugs? Well, interesting also, uh, the, the stability in cell, it has to be tested. We, we are uh, like in, in the, the in vitro, let's say, process uh, with the isolated protein complexes, trying to characterize them fully just to, uh, whenever we're going to go for the cell strategy, we're going to be sure that those are the best candidates to go for. So in terms of the stability inside the cell of these candidates, we can say, but what I can say generally, generally is that nanobodies are really stable. Uh, protein, mo most of the candidates are, are really stable in, in other approaches, but we'll have to try this. I'm uh, sorry, what was the second question? Could the two inhibitory lama bodies be drugs? Uh, oh, nice. Yeah, uh, I didn't mention that 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 also these uh, inhibitory uh, nanobodies that we found also could be I don't know if drugs, but they could be uh, in in terms of of function, but they could be a nice tool to learn uh, more about the the super complex mechanism that is still uh, there are some some parts of the of the that mechanism that we still don't know. So so we see it as as a as valuable tool also. So there are another questions in the uh, chat. So you will maybe answer them. Oh, so we lovely. will. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the thank next you, speaker is uh, Sid Gupti from the University of Florida and who will speak about gene therapy to prevent vision loss in effect. All right, let me share my screen really quickly. Uh, do you see it? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sid, and I am in uh, Dr. Shannon Boy's lab in the University of Florida. And my project involves developing an AAV-based gene therapy to treat the ocular phenotype of Friedrich's ataxia. Now, I first uh, got interested in this study because I am very interested in studying about AAV gene therapy. And I felt like Friedrich's ataxia was, uh, was a, a disease that could benefit from gene therapy, especially AAV mediated. And that is why I joined Dr. Shannon Boy's lab where we specifically studied the retinal uh, features of Friedrich's ataxia and see if we can use AAV gene therapy to help um, improve the quality of life of people suffering from FA. So I'm gonna start off with a very high level basic introduction where I remind everyone that photaxin is the protein that is implicated in Friedrich's ataxia, especially specifically the reduction in the amount of photaxin in um, FA. And this leads to a lot of symptoms, uh, different symptoms uh, throughout the, um, like in patients. And our lab specifically focuses on visual defects. Um, we are doing this mainly because A, our expertise lies in retinal gene therapy, but also uh, a lot of studies are being done on the cardiac and neuronal symptoms of FA, but not specifically on the retinal symptoms. And so in order to better study this, we decided to make a new uh, mouse model, which we call the MRX Fataxin knockout mouse. Um, in this one allele of Fataxin, of the Fataxin gene is completely knocked out. And this is what the second allele of the gene looks like. And we use a Cree uh, protein under the influence of a retina specific promoter to cut out exon two of this gene which results in a, a complete knockout of fataxin protein only in the retina of these mice. Uh, we've tested uh, different parts of these mice and they still have fataxin present, 
only in the retina, fataxin is completely knocked out. And uh, this is an image of the retina from a control animal, which has fataxin still present. And you can see uh, the nice layering of the retinal um, layers or cells. But when you look at uh, an MRX fataxin knockout eye at the same age of the mice, which is 60 days of age, you can see that the retina is completely degraded or degenerated. And I'm going to be talking about mainly the retinal nerve fiber layer in my talk. Um, and this is because if you see this uh, chart, which is a correlation of the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness along with the FARS exam score, a decrease in retinal nerve fiber layer thickness always results in a higher, always has a higher FARS exam score. And if you look at the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness on the left-hand side, uh, in this left-hand side graph, in black, you can see the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness from animals that still have fataxin present in their retina versus in red, where the fataxin has been knocked out. And from 14 days of age to 60 days of age, there's a progressive decline in the thickness of the retinal nerve fiber layer. So once we had characterized this mouse, we wanted to see if uh, what effect our AAV fataxin gene therapy would have on these mice. And we, again, specifically were looking at the retinal nerve fiber layer and retinal ganglion cell layer, which is why we use intravitreal injections of AAV fataxin to better treat the retinal ganglion cells. And uh, before I mentioned the retinal nerve fiber layer, but also in the ganglion cell layer in a plexiform layer, and the outer nuclear layer, which are all layers of the different layers of the retina, we see that there is significantly slower degeneration in animals that were treated with AAV for taxin in red in all the graphs versus animals that were injected with only AAV GFP, which is shown in green. So to summarize this um, study, uh, or the high level view of the study rather, a retina specific for taxin knockout mouse model was generated and intravitreal injection of AAV fataxin was delivered, which resulted in a significantly delayed degeneration of the retinal nerve fiber layer and the other retinal layers. Now, uh, one caveat to this is that in people who are suffering from FA, there is, a, there is some amount of fataxin still present, whereas in our mouse model, the fataxin has been completely knocked out. And this is why the uh, phenotype of this mouse model is so severe in such a short amount of time. Now, when um, if this was to go in patients, there is a, a larger window for treatment of uh, humans uh, rather than this mouse model. And to further study this, we are trying to develop a mouse model with a less aggressive retinal phenotype with which we will continue to evaluate our therapies. And with that, I will take any question. Thank you for listening and for Farah for letting me present here. Thank you very much. Um, seeing if there is any question. Um, so the first one is uh, overexpression of rataxin in cardiomyocyte has been shown to be toxic in several models. Can you predict the phenotype due to the overexpression of rataxin in the eye? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, we haven't done any studies to see the overexpression of fataxin in our uh, eyes. Uh, the control animals that we use and our gene therapy studies have been very short. And this has been mainly because our mouse model, uh, the retina degenerates so fast that we haven't done long-term studies on them. So as of now, I can't um, really answer, like tell you the answer for that question. Okay, thank you. Another question says, do the knockout mice have a functional visual impairment, sight loss, for example? And is it possible to measure that in mice somehow? Yes, so we use electroretinograms to uh, study the um, retinal function of these mice. And even at the earliest time point with that we measured them, which was 21 days of age um, at weaning, uh, these mice have no retinal function. And I didn't show this uh, on these slides because of lack of space, but uh, we use the ERGs and they have no retinal function even at the earliest time point. 
Okay. And um, do you expect any toxicity concern associated uh, with overexpression of rataxine? Um, so in the mouse model, not really, mainly because we have completely knocked out for taxin. And even uh, by giving our AAV for taxin gene therapy, uh, we can only, ex like, we aren't able to completely protect these retinas. Now, that is not to say that there won't be any toxicity, but in our mouse, in this current mouse model, uh, we haven't, and again, this is a very short study, so we haven't had a chance to see the long-term effects, so can't really predict that. Okay. And the question is, what is the developmental profile of the CRE promoter in the MRX CRE mouse? Mm -hmm. Is it expressed embryonically? Yes, uh, so the MRX CRE, uh, so the CRE under the influence of MRX is expressed very early on in the embryo. So um, if I remember rightly, it's between like embryonic day nine and day 13. Okay. So this was the last question. Thank you very much. And you have another uh, in the panel to, to answer if you want. All right, I will, I'll see it. Thank you. So the next speaker is um, Elisabetta Indelicato. She's from the Center of Rare Neurological Disorders in Innsbruck, and she will talk about the studying iron in FA from the gut to the cells. Um, thank you very much, uh, Cecilia, for the introduction. I hope you all hear me. Uh, yeah, my name is Elisabetta, and I'm a um, um, doctor in training at the University of Innsbruck in Austria. And I'm working in FA since 2015. I completed my PhD uh, on FA um, uh, three years ago, and I'm still uh, going on doing clinical research uh, on FA. And uh, I'm very pleased to present uh, uh, my project today that has been founded by FERA, uh, FERA Australia and FERA Ireland. Um, let's uh, start about it. Uh, I would start with some basic fact about iron in FA, which is the topic of this research. Um, you all know that um, the cause of FA is uh, deficiency of this small protein for taxin that uh, uh, resides in the mitochondria. And it's very well known that uh, uh, frataxin deficiency results in an accumulation of iron in the mitochondria that has been uh, demonstrated in several experiments. And why it is important? Because iron is essential for the human body, but when it is too much, it can react with other cell parts and damaging them. Uh, this type of damage is also called oxidative stress, uh, and it has been advocated as one of the possible mechanisms that uh, contribute to the progression of the disease. That's why we are interested in studying it. Now, we know that uh, too little fertaxin is like too, lit too much iron, but um, actually it has not been studied what happens with this iron before it enters into the cells. Uh, that is important because our body doesn't have a system to actively eliminate the iron when it's too much. So it has to control everything in another way, uh, which is control the absorption of iron from the diet. Um, and that's what we are interested in. Um, a central role in that is played by the liver. The liver has the biggest iron storages in our body. And when this iron storages are too much, uh, the liver produced this uh, small molecule, hepcidin, a hormone that circulates in the blood. And hepcidin um, arrives in the gut where it can block this small cargo, ferroportin, that usually enables the passage of iron from the gut in the blood. Um, what we are interested in is to check if in FA, the body senses that there is too much iron and can answer to this accumulation uh, with a feedback on this system, hepcidin and ferroportin. Um, how are we going to uh, study uh, this regulating system? Um, we do um, blood withdrawal in a patient uh, with a FA in the carriers and in healthy control. And we can first directly measure in the blood hormones like hepcidin, as well as other uh, iron regulating proteins. Um, from the whole blood, then we extract the so-called PBMCs. Those are the white blood cells, which are usually responsible for our immune response. 
because in this um, cells we can directly uh, measure in a more precise way the local production of protein as hepcidin and ferroportin and so check directly at the cellular level if also this mechanism are impaired. Uh, and what we also do is uh, magnetic resonance imaging uh, of the liver and of other abdominal organs like the pancreas and the spleen to directly quantify by mean of this magnetic resonance uh, the iron content in these organs. We are doing that in a FA patient, as I said, in a carrier and in healthy controls. Um, and uh, we are in the study right now, and I have some preliminary results that uh, show that this feedback system is somehow impaired in FA compared uh, to the healthy controls. Um, I will be pleased to be able to present you the full result uh, in the next session. Um, and meanwhile, I'm very happy to take questions. And uh, if uh, some questions do not rise up right now, you can uh, feel free, please, to write me. Uh, and thank to Faro once again for having found in this research. Thank you very much, Elisabeth. I have a quick question. And um, this uh, is this protein, uh, hepcidin, present in adipose tissue, in fat um, tissue? Well, hepcidin, uh, as I said, um, at a systemic level is uh, mostly synthesized by the liver. So the hepcidin that you measure in the blood is the one that is synthesized by the liver. But actually, um, several cells type uh, can produce it locally. Uh, mm -hmm. The leukocytes, for sure, because we've measured it. Uh, I know that in FA, it has been measured, for example, in the heart, where the macrophages and um, okay. inflammatory infiltrate uh, produces it. Um, if also adipocytes explicitly produces it, that um, it's something that I don't really know. Uh, mm -hmm. But however, several cells type can produce it, and the one that is produced then uh, from these other cells acts just locally, not in the blood. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm seeing if there is any other question. So, Elisabetta, do you think that this is could be a, a, a side and could be like a therapeutic target? How do you see if they, this, um, you know, system is, uh, you know, dysregulated? Um, how do you see this as being a, a therapeutic target? You know, there's, there's been other intervention that, you know, use, uh, you know, iron chelators that haven't really, um, you know, really pan out in clinical trials. Is this a different way of regulating iron? Yeah, I mean, this is a, let's say, a different way maybe to approach the problem um, because um, we know, I mean, the last uh, research point out that uh, maybe uh, in a fight there is not simply an iron accumulation. There is not simply too much iron, but this iron, it somehow shifted in a wrong way. Um, and um, let's say uh, now we wait for the final result of this research, uh, but of course these findings would be very interesting because in other iron disorders, for example, hemochromatosis, um, therapies are developing that focuses on the, uh, let's say the players of this pathway. Uh, also therapy that uh, um, target hepcidin, for example, so that um, one could take advantage of this discoveries in other fields and translate them in FA. Um, I have a question it says, uh, can liver MRI predict severity of FA or outcomes phenotypes? Um, well, as far as I know, uh, there are no previous research about liver MRI in FA. Um, but uh, another aspect in which we are interested in it is not just the content of iron uh, in the liver, but also the global state of the liver in FA, um, because FA is basically a mitochondrial disorder, so uh, metabolic disorders. And we know that patients with FA are more sensitive to several drugs, and all the drugs are metabolized by the liver. And so um, we expect also other results from this um, studies that maybe would help 
and um, and uh, let's say evaluate uh, the sensitivity to medication, for example, or how good is the metabolism uh, of FA patient, said in a simple way. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we are going to pass to the last speaker, um, which is Nicolette Silenti from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, she will talk about My Heart Shop, an app to measure and monitor exercise. I think, okay, perfect. To share my screen. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Nikki Salenti and I'm currently an undergraduate student at the University of Pennsylvania studying bioengineering. I'll be speaking to you about My Heart Chop, an app designed by cardiologists at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, or CHOP, to monitor heart rate during exercise as part of a clinical trial. I first became interested in FA research through my mentors and I've become increasingly interested in understanding how we can utilize wearable technology in the context of research. I'm an avid exerciser myself, and I've actually been using my heart over the course of the past few weeks. I've, using the, I've been using this app um, to try and gain a better understanding of the technology and how it functions, as well as trying to understand some of the challenges our participants may face. The goal of this study is to see how exercise and a supplement can improve overall health and fitness in people with FA. Although we have some intuition that exercise will be beneficial, it has not yet been systematically studied in people with FA, so we are looking to see what benefits, if any, it may have. However, the prescription of exercise and research brings about the question of how will we monitor exercise at home and how can we quantify the quality of exercise participants are having outside of the hospital? In response to this question, My Heart Shop was developed, an app that can be utilized to prescribe exercise to participants at home and can be used to track and monitor exercise for future sessions. At the beginning of the study, participants will come to CHOP for an in-person study visit lasting two to three days. During this visit, participants will undergo a maximal exercise test. During this maximal exercise test, the participant's max heart rate as well as their resting heart rate will be measured. These will be important parameters for use in future exercise sessions. After this first visit, participants will be randomized to one of four, to one of four groups. Two of these groups will be actively exercising. After the participants are randomized, the exercise participants will go home and they will begin a 12-week exercise intervention. This 12-week exercise intervention will consist of three days per week of biking on a recumbent tricycle and two days per week of strength training. The biking sessions will be used and recorded through My Heart. During these cardio sessions, participants will unlock their Fitbit and navigate to the app, hop on their bike um, and press begin. They will begin biking uh, with a five minute warm-up period 20 minutes of actively biking and a five minute cool down, and then we'll press stop in the app. The app will monitor their heart rate and record it over the course of their entire session. During these cardio biking sessions, the goal is to spend 20 minutes in their target heart rate zone. This target heart rate zone is individualized for every person as calculated by taking 70% of the maximum from their first in-person study visit. Now, looking at this graph on the screen, I can kind of delve into what this all means and kind of explain what one cardio session might look like. So um, on this graph, the red line represents the heart rate of a participant at every second over the course of one cardio session. The black line at the top is their maximum heart rate from the initial study visit. And the black line at the bottom is their resting heart rate from the initial study visit. The purple shaded region represents this person's target heart rate zone. As you can see, this person spent the majority of their exercise within this target heart rate zone. Um, so our results from these first 10 exercisers can give us a lot of information about the study as well as the app itself. If a participant was to complete every session in the app over the course of 12 weeks, so three cardio sessions times 12 weeks, there would be 36 sessions recorded in the app. Due to some connectivity issues participants may face with the app um, or, or missing a session here or there, participants spent anywhere between 16 to 36 sessions logged in my heart. Nine out of these 10 first exercisers were able to meet their goal of spending 20 minutes in the target heart rate zone for at least one session. The target heart rate, the target, the 10 participants were able to meet this goal of 20 minutes for an average of 12 sessions with a range of five to 28 sessions. 
And an additional parameter that we can use my heart to measure is the percent of heart rate reserve that participants are using. So the average percent of heart rate reserve across all participants across all sessions was 39%. So some of the key takeaways we've learned so far from these initial 10 exercisers is that my heart can be used to measure a variety of things. It can be used to measure the time that participants spend in their target heart rate zone, the time they spend in or above their target heart rate zone, the percentage of the heart rate reserve that they're utilizing, as well as many other parameters we haven't looked into so far. It can also give us some information about the app itself and any challenges we may need to face um, or updates we need to make to the app itself. So some common questions we get about the study is that the study is 12 weeks long, travel to CHOP will be reimbursed, the bike and the smartwatch are supplied, um, and if you're assigned to a no exercise group originally, you'll have the opportunity to complete this exercise regimen following the study. If you're interested or have any questions, please feel free to reach out to our study coordinator, Anna Dedio, um, all of her information is on the screen, or reach out to someone at Farah so we can answer any of your questions. Um, I would like to thank all of my mentors, all of the collaborators, including Kyle Bryant, who's on the bike in the screen, all of the participants who have completed the study so far, as well as everyone at Farah for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolette. <laughs> so one question is here. Um, do you estimate heart rate variability as a parameter for your insights? Can you say that one more time? Do you estimate heart rate variability as a parameter for your insights? Um, so I don't think we've looked at heart rate variability so far. But during this initial study visit at CHOP, um, during the maximal exercise test done, a variety of parameters on heart rate are measured. And then these are used to help individualize a parameter for every participant. Um, so at CHOP, members of our study team will work to find heart rates and like parameters that will work for each individual specifically. Thanks. So Nikki, just just to clarify, yes, the the um, participants will do both uh, cardio exercises and strength training, right? Yes, every so week. You, okay, so do do you think um, you'll eventually you'll maybe try to separate the two and see whether one versus the other as uh, in a, um, you know a, an effect or um, on on yeah. So in this study, I think we're kind of looking at overall exercise um, and the benefits of a variety of exercise, including cardio and strength training and how this may have benefits. Um, but somewhere down the line, we might split this up and look at the different benefits of cardio training alone versus strength training and what differences they may have um, in improving people's conditions with FA. Okay, thank you. Um, another question says, what are the endpoints you will test to determine if the exercise made a difference? So um, this study is actively recruiting. So we are continuing um, exercise and a lot of our participants. So we've yet to unblind and look at the results. Um, but right now my heart is kind of recording all this data that we are hoping to be able to use as potential parameters to analyze their improvements in fitness over time. Um, but we haven't yet done that in our study. Thank you. Um, well, another question says that this person is always interested in understanding the exclusion criteria for exercise intervention studies for patients with diagnosed cardiac impairment. Can you comment on that, please, in this study? And what target heart rate is safe? Thanks. Yes, okay, great question. Um, so I'm not overly familiar with the exact requirements um, for inclusion or exclusion of the study, but definitely please reach out to our study coordinator, Anna Dedio, if you're interested in learning more about if you may qualify, if you're interested. Um, and then the target heart rate that is safe is something that we've kind of been considering and thinking about with these target heart rate zones. And once again, this is definitely individual for every participant. Um, so during my study visit, and also meeting with a cardiologist, um, we're trying to come up with parameters and regions that will be safe for moderate exercise, but this also varies person to person on what would be considered safe. Um, so it's definitely something that you should speak to a doctor about or like during our visits, the cardiologist will help explore it with you individually. Okay, so the another says, have you looked into using an Apple Watch 
and its EECG feature? Um, I am not overly familiar if we have looked into an Apple Watch or not, but I know that the My Heart app itself has been designed for use in a Fitbit. So that is what we are currently studying and analyzing. And another question says, do you see the app as being useful for research, like a studying patient as a whole, or for a clinical treatment on an individual basis? So I think this app has a lot of potential to be used in research also on a clinical basis. And it's very much in its preliminary steps uh, where we are just starting to use this and try and understand its benefits. Um, for our use in particular, I think we're trying to use it in research as a way to monitor exercise um, outside of the hospital. So when participants can't be monitored by this technology or other measures that are in the hospital, this is a way to look at their exercise quality while they're at home and to see if like they're following their protocols I think that's more of where we're looking at it right now, uh, but it's definitely in its preliminary stages and we are trying to explore all the benefits my heart might have for all people down the road. Thank you. Yes. So that was the last question for now. Perfect. Uh, yes. Okay. All right. So let me, let me end this. Um, this was another great webinar. Um, and I want to thank you all the speakers today. Uh, wonderful job. We appreciate your hard work. Uh, thank you so much, Cecilia, for moderating. Um, I remind everybody to keep the browser open and vote. Um, and uh, please tune in again next Thursday, May 19 at noon Eastern time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye.